Uh, so we will slide into announcements and updates. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention that this is the one year anniversary of the passing of George Floyd. And I think a moment of silence is warranted. Okay, thank you very much. And welcome, Bernard. Oh. <laughs> so do any board members wish to speak um, announcements and updates or about uh, George Floyd? Miriam. Um, so I really appreciate you taking that moment to talk about George Floyd. Um, and uh, I uh, encourage everybody to keep in mind that this is not it's not just one day, this is an ongoing everyday fight um, and lives depend on it. So please keep up the good work. Uh, I also want to mention on a completely separate note um, that there are still two more uh, uh, vaccine clinics for students, for kids age 12 and above. Um, Wednesday, May 26th at the Baker School from 12.30 to 4.30 and Thursday, May 27th at the Florida Rough and Ridley School from 2.30 to 6. Uh, so please, please get yourself vaccinated, get your kids vaccinated, uh, and uh, that's it, thanks. Great. Anyone else wish to make an announcement or share their thoughts on this anniversary? Um, Raul, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> Raul raised his hand slightly before you did, John. Yeah. I think, I think we were both deferring to one another there. Um, so, you know, I'll just say, I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate us marking this moment. And, um, and, and I, you know, I'm reminded that moments of silence should be followed by moments of action. Uh, and, you know, it's important to mark this, the sort of tragic anniversary, um, the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, and also to recognize that Floyd's death um, was captured on camera by those held at bay by Chauvin's fellow officers. And this became a, a symbol of our collective failure to protect black and brown people from the fatal consequences of racism and dehumanization that's embedded in all of our systems, including policing. Um, it's important also that we take stock of what we've accomplished and what we failed as a community and as a select board in reimagining our system of public safety while ensuring that policing remains, uh, that policing that remains is safer, more transparent and more accountable. Uh, in my view, we haven't done nearly enough to ensure that sufficient investments have been made in non-policing strategies that can address the issues that are caused by racial and economic inequities. Uh, I believe we need to fully fund social services uh, approach to these issues. And while we've taken an important first step in funding a staff member and a consultant, I do hope my colleagues are going to join me in ensuring that a more robust uh, allocation to those services appears in our next budget. Um, in my view, we haven't done nearly enough to address uh, accountability in our police department. Uh, the police commissioner's advisory committee is a positive, yes, but insufficient first step. Uh, look forward to working with my colleagues in the PCAC to promulgate serious, meaningful, and sensible limitations on what police can do and how they do it. Uh, we live in a community where just about everyone wants to call themselves progressive, um, but unfortunately too few are willing to challenge the antiquated systems like policing, and that needs to change. Uh, preservers of the status quo um, you seek to claim progressive status, even while criticizing those of us who seek meaningful, measurable progress. And we do need to overcome their intransigence. Um, you know, Brookline residents support reimagining and the Brookline Forward Agenda, as well as reducing the scope and scale of policing. We heard that loud and clear in public hearings and in the recent election. Uh, I am hopeful that this new board will step up, meet the moment, and do the right thing. And I can't think of any better way to honor the life of George Floyd and too many others whose lives could have been saved if we all acted sooner. So thank you. John. Yeah, thanks, Heather. And, and thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Raul, for your comments as well. And thank you, uh, Heather, for the moment of silence. Um, yeah, I, uh, I just want to say a couple of things. And, and one is that um, I want to thank both the task force and uh, the uh, Bernard Green's uh, reform committee for the work they did I want to thank the members of both of those groups. Um, 
I don't take um, quite as dim a view as Raoul does of where we are right now. I think we have made progress and I think they deserve thanks for the progress we've made. And I think we're on the verge of making more progress. And I think that's how these, I think that's how change happens. Um, it doesn't always happen um, uh, in the moment, uh, as soon as it is urgent. It happens um, in the aftermath of a, a tragedy. And in this case, one of the worst tragedies, frankly, that I've witnessed, or I think America has, has witnessed um, in my lifetime. Um, uh, to, no matter how much time elapses, whether it's a year or 10 years or, or 100 years, the, the events of that moment, you know, when, when an individual officer kneeled on the neck of a, of a man who frankly was innocent of no matter what you might think he was guilty of, um, to the point of willfully killing him, um, it is one of the most chilling experiences I've ever had uh, had to witness, and, and which I think you know many people feel the same way about it. Um, that's going to result um, in very dramatic change, um, and it's going to take step by step progress to get there. Um, and I think thanks to the two groups that worked on this for the past year, we've already made some steps. I think we're going to make steps, additional steps in the next year, and I think we just need to. Keep together, keep pulling together, and um, keep um, keep focused on getting to the goal. And uh, I, I think we're going to get there. Bernard, would you like to say anything? I guess I'd like to emphasize something that John said, and that uh, yeah, this is a process. Um, if we want instant action, well, we're not going to get it, uh, no matter how how passionate we are about. Uh, about it or, or uh, demanding it, uh, you know, change in policing or change in any other area of life is a process and it's sometimes slow. If you look at American history, uh, the ebbs, ebbs and flows of uh, reaction and, and, um, and progressive uh, uh, action um, is seen from the very beginning. Um, so, you know, all I can say, and I came in late to this conversation is that uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress in this town, both uh, as a result of the two committees work as well as before it. Uh, and if we um, think like, like I used to when I was a kid, think that uh, progress and, and change is instantaneous, uh, we're gonna lose an opportunity that we have here to make significant change that may uh, take uh, a little while. Uh, but we're laying the foundation uh, and that foundation will mean that we'll have an e effective um, uh, change in both policing as well as uh, all the myriad other issues that we face in this town, so. Okay, Miriam, uh, I mean, we're, we're 20. And let's not get into a, a back and forth on this. Okay. I really want Actually, to I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't gonna comment to you, Bernard. Okay. Uh, what I was gonna comment is that, it, you know, it's okay. Uh, I, I think what's really important is that we don't keep doing the same thing we need to do new things to see new change. And that's all I'm gonna say. Okay. I will also, this is a question of privilege, honestly. Um, just briefly, I'll just say, um, you know, this idea that, that, that the kind of thinking that I espoused is childlike. And I know you didn't exactly say that, but you said the way that you used to think as a child, I'm a 44 year old man. Um, who thinks differently than you do about these issues. And I think, um, I think denigrating that kind of view is, is um I don't know anyway. Well, I'm sorry. I'm gonna you, stop. You I'm gonna stop. It that way. I'm it gonna stop there. But let's, let's let's move on. Let's um, this is why this is why you don't want to go first because then people take their time to be able to comment on your comment. Uh, don't get instead so of just making about this. Let's, let's move forward. You're misinterpreting what I said. Let's move into public comment, which I believe we have two people signed up for. Um, we will be holding them to time, uh, no more than fifteen minutes for the entire content of public content, please. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for public comment. This is an opportunity for us to hear your perspective on the issues that matter to you. Um, we do have a few rules I'd like to share. Each person speaking is limited to just three minutes. You don't need to use the entire time, but you may if you like. Uh, please refrain from personal attacks and from addressing personnel issues during your comments. Uh, members of the public sometimes raise questions during public comment. We may be able to provide a quick answer to a question, but are more likely to work with staff to get a more thorough answer 
and respond over email. Uh, Devin Fields will let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is up, please do conclude your remarks at that time. Uh, if you have more to say, you're welcome to send an email to board members expressing your thoughts in greater detail. That's it, Devin, who's first on our list? The first person signed up for public comment is Rebecca Stone. Rebecca, you have been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute when you're ready and your three minutes will begin. Okay, thanks very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, I am Rebecca Stone. Um, I live on Toxteth Street in Brookline. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 3. I'm also the chair of the Brookline Commission for Women. Hi to everybody. I think I know you all. I think you all know me. Um, as you know, uh, Michael Zurab and I are here tonight. I hope Michael's here um, to, uh, to urge you to advocate for as strongly as you can for the legislature to pass companion bills that have been introduced in the House and the Senate, the H3213 and S2104, um, that would make permanent the expansion of the open meeting law that's allowed public boards and commissions to meet remotely during the pandemic. Um, I know you all um, got the email that I wrote to you earlier today that a hearing on these bills um, before the Joint Committee on State Administration and Regulatory Oversight has been scheduled for next Wednesday, June 2nd at 10.30 a.m. Um, I will say that without irony, um, it will be a virtual hearing, um, and I hope that the folks at that hearing understand that this is somewhat iron ironic that they are holding a virtual hearing, which will probably be robustly well attended um, because it's a virtual hearing. Um, last August, the Commission for Women um, endorsed this idea of extending the open meeting law allowances for public um, boards and commissions. You supported that with your letter of November 9th, and I really thank you again for um, the select board's action on that. Also want to um, thank all of you who have gotten in touch with me over the last couple of days and with Michael um, pledging your support again for this new legislation that's been introduced. Um, and I want to thank Mr. Kleckner for um, looping me in on the governor's announcement um, today that he's asking the legislature to give everyone in Massachusetts till September 1st to figure out what's next for local meeting access. Um, but I really hope that even with the governor's um, announcement that no one's going to let up on the advocacy for this permanent change. We know that the option of remote participation has greatly increased civic participation by eliminating some of the barriers that folks that keep folks from showing up to meetings um, and that keep them from serving on boards and commissions, which is very, very important to to all of us that um, that uh, increasing the diversity and participation on our boards and commissions that, that Brookline enjoys and wants to enjoy more of. We also hear all the time that women are the overwhelming majority of the, of the people who face the multiplicity of constraints to service um, that, that, pre that prevent people from doing this, inflexible work hours plus family caregiving. You have 30 seconds. And, um, and I wanted to emphasize that having this option of remote participation is not a requirement to be all remote or to implement some kind of hybrid model. What it gives us, if this legislation passes, what it gives us is options. Um, and that cannot be a bad thing um, to pursue greater participation, which is our objective. Um, I think Michael wants to talk some more about the um, huge support that his letter on this issue generated. And thank you again for your time tonight. I'll take that as a cue. Um, thanks, Rebecca. I'm uh, and and all of you. I'm Michael Zurab, town meeting member in Precinct Three. I don't want to take too much of your time because I know it's a rather busy evening for many of us, and certainly for all of you. Um, so I'll just say a few things. First, I think as you've seen from the letter that Rebecca mentioned, there's quite a lot of support in our community from town meeting members and other residents um, for allowing continued remote options for participation. I'd like to expound a little bit more on, on why I think this is super important for Brookline and why I think you all as people who staff so many of our boards and commissions should care about this and devote your own time towards advocating for this legislation. Um, we rely so much on essentially volunteer efforts to run this town, all our various boards and commissions and committees and subcommittees. And I think we really limit ourselves. We limit our talent pool um, when we create barriers to people participating. And so, you know, I, the way I see the, the importance of, one of the many important uh, elements of allowing options for remote meetings is allowing folks who 
work or who are parents or caregivers or people with disabilities to serve on our boards and commissions and contribute their talents to our town government. I think we want to have as broad a pool as possible to serve on our various volunteer boards and commissions. And that ensures that, you know, things like our reform or reimagining committees are successful. I think about my experiences as a sub chair, as a chair of a subcommittee on the policing reforms committee and some of my friends and colleagues who chaired uh, subcommittees. And frankly, given the fact that we work, it would not have been possible to chair those subcommittees if we were going in person. Um, many times the, the meetings took place during the day for example. So, you know, there's a, a huge equity element of this. Another face to that, and really it's the same issue, is just the efficiency of our form of government. We rely on volunteer um, volunteers to make this town work, and by reducing barriers to volunteers participating, it can work work better. You have 30 um, seconds. And so that's, uh, that's it. I hope that you you know, not just support support this with words, but take some some time to advocate for uh, this legislation by lobbying our representatives and senators and by speaking at uh, the hearing that uh, Rebecca Stone sent to you all. Uh, thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Deborah Brown. Deborah, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your three minutes will begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, you know, I thought about George Floyd today, and as I was listening to you all speak, one of the things that, that struck me was when I was in law school, and uh, I remember somebody talking about, you know, what our mission was as attorneys. And, 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 and the message was clear to me that it was the preservation of the status quo. And it took me a while to understand that. Because I thought, you know, I was doing good work, but what I was really doing was making it safe for the people that some who did good things, but a lot of people who did evil things to stay in place. So when I, when I hear words like it's a process, I know what that means, partly because I may have used it. It's a stall. It's an opportunity to allow yourself to save face instead of confronting how you actually participate in actions or activities that undermine what our most vulnerable need. George Floyd didn't need a process. There was a process in place. There was a process in place. And that process won't bring him back at all. And so I select board, y'all are all smart, loving people. You have an opportunity to do a, something more than say, how do we honor George Floyd? You know, we have the, you know, the American Rescue Plan Act. That's, that's going to bring what, $32 million to this town? Well, that's our opportunity to step up and act. And it doesn't mean that we're, we're looking for anything as instantaneous or juvenile or naive. It means that we will use the collective wisdom of people to use that money as it was intended. And Mel has said more than once that that money has to go to people who were most impacted by COVID. You have 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. And, and that means, in 30 seconds, it means housing, housing, housing. And that's everything from making housing repairs at BHA to providing funds for lead abatement, regardless of the properties, uh, creating home buying opportunities for low-income people who can actually afford the mortgage, but who don't have the down payment, uh, building, building. We could build. We need to close the school achievement gap. You've reached we need to make. I got two, I got five more seconds. 
We're already at 630. I have to wrap this meeting by 655 for big to go into town meeting. So there's somebody else in the queue. I'm sorry, Deborah. That's okay. That's okay. I hear you. It's no problem. The next person signed up for public comment is Erin Deemer. Erin, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable and your time will begin. Hi there. Um, good evening. My name is Erin Deemer. I live on Abbotsford Road. Um, and this is my first pu uh, public comment after 10 years of living here, but I feel quite passionately about this. Um, I wanted to comment tonight to follow up on a lengthy letter that I sent to the select board yesterday <laughs> expressing my concerns um, regarding state reported data on Brookline's vaccination rates. Um, thus far, I've been really impressed with the rigor um, Dr. Jeff's department and the select board have taken with regards to tracking and reporting on COVID case rates within Brookline and thoughtfully deliberating actions such as mask mandates, three foot versus six foot distance in schools, et cetera. I wanna see the same transparency, communication, rigorous analysis and goal setting applied to encouraging and supporting as many as our citizens to be vaccinated as possible. Um, since the state began publishing reports um, detailing vaccination rates by municipalities a few weeks ago, I've become increasingly alarmed to see that Brookline appears to be significantly behind many of our neighboring communities. Um, therefore, I was really glad to see a COVID update on the agenda at Thursday's select board meeting. Um, but after watching the replay of the meeting, I remain concerned that we're not taking the time to really review and discuss the data that exists to understand where we are with vaccinations, why we're there, where we want to be, and how we as a town will get to where we want to be. Um, just a couple of the highlights that concerned me. Um, of course, sorry, my camera's covered up. Um, we always use Newton as a comparator, but I, I sent the Excel spreadsheet so you can use any town you want. But if you do compare us to Newton, um, among the 65 to 74, um, we're showing a 72% vaccination rate. Um, among 75 plus, we're showing um, a seven, sorry, 78%. Um, Newton is at 95% plus for these groups. Um, and I also did a comparison of all the towns that have a similar size population of seniors as we do. Um, if you look at uh, the list of 28 towns with 4,000 to 8,000 people in the 65 to 74 group, um, we are dead last in that group. And we're not only dead last, we are five percentage points um, below the next lowest town. Um, so for me, that means that one in four or one in five of our seniors is to date not had their first shot, not fully vaccinated, but not even had their first shot. Um, and if you don't find these compelling, you can, you can cut the data any way you want. Um, now, are these state numbers correct? You have 30 I seconds. frankly, thank you. I frankly don't know, but I think we as a community and you as a select board, we really need to understand these numbers. And my request is that the select board ask for weekly reports on where we are in terms of vaccination rates and that Dr. Jess' department regularly communicates to the public where we are and that the select board pay special attention to the vaccination rates of those in our 65 plus age group and request a detailed plan and campaign to help us close the gap, if indeed we do have a gap. So thank you for your attention to this. The next person signed up for public comment is Naomi Schweitzer. Naomi, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your three minutes will begin. Good evening, everyone. Naomi Schweitzer, town meeting member, uh, Precinct 10. Um, I'm commenting tonight on a couple of issues. One is I just wanted to second and third everything that Rebecca Stone and Michael uh, Zubra uh, pointed out around remote participation um, and just encourage the board uh, to do everything in your power um, to support the governor's action that was taken today and uh, pushing our legislature to make these uh, remote participation changes permanent uh, to increase participation. It's just been absolutely amazing to see, particularly with town meeting, uh, the increased attendance um, and several points during COVID we've had close to 100% attendance of town meeting members um, and to all the points they made earlier, which I won't repeat, that just makes these meetings more accessible to a greater slice of our community. And we really need to hear and include their voices and this makes it more possible for them to do so. The second issue I wanted to comment on is the housing production plan. 
Uh, my understanding, and this may be incorrect, um, is that the town has received a response to uh, the, the NOFA or the request for proposals that went out for a consultant to do the housing production plan and that there has been one response. Um, and my question is, is that true? And um, is the select board going to open up uh, the process again to get a greater selection of consultants for the housing production plan? Um, part of my concern around this lies with making sure that we um, have a, a choice to make um, among consultants. Um, and if we're going to truly have a participatory process uh, with the community engagement part of the housing production plan, uh, that we need to have more breadth of choice um, and who our consultants are. And I wanna note that representation of who those consultants are um, combined with who our planning department is, our planning department is overwhelmingly white and the affordable housing field and planning field while changing also uh, is overwhelmingly white. And it's important that we look for representation because if we want to have a robust community engagement process that includes all of our voices in town, it's important to have that there so that- yeah, 30 folks seconds that folks feel comfortable um, with the people who are before them and leading the process. I also wanna note with the housing production plan um, that I hope it will be different this time compared to the 2016 plan, which in my opinion, mostly just sat on a shelf and didn't accomplish very much. So I'm looking forward to what this next iteration uh, will accomplish. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Basically, 18 minutes to try to do uh, a lot. So bear with me, folks. <laughs> um, I'm going to a move to approve the open session meeting minutes from May 19th, 2021, and the regular meeting minutes from May 20th, 2021. Bernard. Yes. John. Uh, uh, sorry, Raul. Aye. John. Aye. Miriam. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, you all are familiar with the consent agenda that is outlined in our uh, agenda that we send out to the public. I'm not going to read uh, what is there, but I will say that we have chosen to postpone uh, item 6C. Um, so, uh, Bernard. Yes. Uh, Raul. Aye. John. Aye. Miriam. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Now we are sliding into um, the select board committee assignments, although maybe we should postpone this. What do you think, Devin? Uh, you can always take it up at the end if there's time. Okay, let's do that if there's time. Ah, yes. So our first interview for uh, the, the open position on the planning board, welcome Shelly. If you wanna just give like a, really brief, like 30 second elevator pitch of who you are and why you're interested. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm operating at light speed now for you all. My name is Shelly Chapimo. I am a designer and project manager at UTL, where I've been for the past three years. And um, prior to that, I worked at William Mon Associates um, during my undergrad. I have been a Brookline resident for the last two and a half years, um, and I um, am really interested in serving on this board because I do have a passion for community projects. And throughout my per professional experience at UTL, I have been engaged in uh, many capacities um, in projects in multiracial and diverse neighborhoods. Um, and I've learned from that experience as well as other experiences that finding consensus on issues that benefit the community as they relate to building practices is never quite smooth sailing, but um, it's important to find a diversity in perspective. And if chosen to serve on the board, I do think that I, as a young um, person with a diverse background could bring some fresh perspective to the Brookline Planning Board um, and learn how to be a better architect, practitioner, and advocate for um, typically underrepresented groups. I hope that was <laughs> short and sweet for you all. <laughs> did fantastic. So I'm gonna limit this to two questions because then we got to take another interview and we've got warrant articles to try to do in basically 10 minutes. Miriam. 
Uh, uh, Shelly, I chatted your website into the panelists box. I suggest Great. everyone take a look at it. It is excellent. No question. Oh, I just you. want everyone to look. <laughs> thank you so much. Excellent. Well, if there are no questions, we will definitely take a look. Uh, and you, I mean, you really nailed that interview. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing millennials are good at, it's speaking very quickly. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interest. And we will be making appointments very, very soon. So we will be in touch. Sure thing. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have another interview, uh, David. Um, that's a hard act to follow. So 30 second elevator pitch. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is David Dininger and I, my family and I have been residents of uh, Brookline for 20 years. I am a registered architect in Massachusetts since 1986 and a lead accredited professional since 2006. I'm currently a hospital facility master planning consultant. I started my own business in 2011 and I do strategic facility master planning around the country, helping mainly small provider hospitals kind of get their act together. Prior to that, I was at uh, a, a partner at uh, TRO. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it's the Smith Group. Uh, and they, they also specialize in healthcare, uh, architecture and engineering. You know, I feel we're, at, we're all at an inflection point uh, regarding climate and uh, social equity. You know, we must confront all of these challenges together as a planet, you know, as a country, um, as a town and, and as individuals as well. You know, since they all will have a lasting impact on, uh, on Brookline sustainable development, including, you know, smart growth, carbon footprint, tax base, open space, architectural heritage, and, uh, and transportation. We need to address all of these critical issues from many different perspectives the macro to the micro, and the strategic to the tactical, all while incorporating you know, a diverse set of constituents' uh, voices to establish you know, equitable policies, guidelines, and real-time planning decisions, and balancing the not only the short, but the long-term ramifications. Great. I really want to open this up to select board members' questions, because I've got basically 10 minutes left to address no our meeting. Uh, anyone have any questions for David? David, how long have you lived in town? 20 years. Oh, wow. Uh, John, I saw your hand up. Yeah, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to ask this uh, of the previous uh, applicant, but uh, have you been able to familiarize yourself with uh, basically the duties of planning board membership and um, the frequency of their meetings, the obligations that will fall on you in terms of attendance and so on? Yeah, I have. I've, I've been uh, attending quite a few recent uh, planning board meetings remotely, and that's been convenient for sure. Um, you know, as I said, I work for myself, so I have a pretty flexible schedule. Uh, you know, I know that, you know, the meetings are frequent, and, uh, and even subcommittee meeting uh, duties can add to it as well. But I'm uh, up for the task and uh, excited to, it would be a privilege to serve. Great, thank you so much. We will be making appointments soon and we okay. will certainly let you know. Thanks. Thank you very Good much. For Thanks David. Okay, so um, warrant articles, uh, further review, possible reconsideration or vote on the warrant articles, uh, 17, um, a short-term rental alternative. Uh, I believe this is a motion to refer. Is this Deborah Brown's motion to refer? Ah, uh, Melissa. Good evening, uh, Melissa Goff, Deputy Town Administrator. Uh, so the motions in front of you are for referral of articles 14 through 17, uh, with the exception of the contingent motion, which is excluded from the referral motion. Is there an appetite on the board to move for reconsideration and, um, and then vote 
on the uh, motion to refer. I personally would like to stay in our position because this has been referred to two committees prior to this. Um, I would kind of like to move on to the other warrant articles, but if anybody wants to have us reconsider, uh, I will I will move that. No? Okay, great. Uh, so moving right along uh, is warrant articles 19 and 20. So articles 19 and 20, you should see in the uh, supplement, night three supplement, um, the referral motion offered by Susan Park for both articles 19 and 20 uh, to be uh, referred to a committee appointed by the moderator for further study and a report at the next town meeting. Okay. Uh, again, um, I, I may feel differently about these warrant articles. I, the, I, I've certainly found them a little confusing and heck, I'm on the select board. So, uh, but I do worry about the consequences when we refer things to committees, we all end up having to do a lot of the work. So uh, does anybody want to move reconsideration of our current position on 19 and 20 to then consider this motion to refer? Seeing none, we're going to move along. Um, and I think I, oh, the special town meeting warrant articles. So I think, didn't we have 33 um, as a, a potential okay. uh, re reconsideration? Well, I think yeah, let's dispense with that. Um, there's been a request to move reconsideration uh, for um, Miriam to weigh in on warrant article 33. So I move reconsideration of warrant article 33. Uh, Bernard, and you're muted. It's the it's the one where we- um, Public notification public on emergency public spending. Emergency, yeah, emergency funding. You're muted. Was it before? Um, no. Okay, uh, Raul. Aye. John. Mm, uh, no. Now this is just for reconsideration. Right. Okay. Um, Miriam. Aye. Uh, the chair votes aye. Um, and so the question is, it, it, I move, what was it? Um, the petitioners? So the board currently is uh, supporting the advisory committee motion, which provides additional flexibility on the timing of the reports. The okay. petition motion uh, re requires quarterly reports. I will um, just add some more information that uh, with the guidance that has been released, uh, the treasury is requiring quarterly reporting. So I, I am a little concerned about kind of how, how, what the petitioner envisions in terms of uh, the timing of the reporting required by the bylaw and then the reporting required by the federal government. I don't yeah. know if she's still here or if she, um, if she knew that we were going to be taking it up again. I'm not sure that we really have time. I've got seven minutes to wrap this meeting. Um, so, Naomi, you've got 30 seconds if you want to make a comment. Yeah, that it's great to hear that the ARPA funds are on a quarterly reporting schedule. So I think that's an alignment. Uh, the warrant article, though, is broader than the ARPA funds. It's for any emergency funds that the town receives. Um, and so the petitioner's version is putting forth quarterly reporting uh, whenever the town receives that kind of funding so that the public and town bodies have a reliable uh, source of information on that quarterly schedule because the federal government <laughs> changes their reporting schedule for every fund that they put out. So we can't depend on the fact that it's necessarily gonna be quarterly for the next pot of money. Yep. Heather, you're- uh... Heather, you're muted. Oh, thank you very much, Naomi, for that concise um, statement. So I move um, favorable action on the AC's version uh, or motion. Um, is that our current position? I thought that, 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 current that position. is our current yeah. position. Uh, Bernard. Yes. Uh, Raul. No. John. Aye. Uh, Miriam. No. And the chair votes aye. Thank you.
Thank you. The next item is the special town meeting. You should have in your night three supplement package uh, rev motions provided by Deborah for articles one and two. They are in the form of resolutions, which were distributed yesterday. So Deborah, I we have to end at 6.55. Well, let's just be quick then. Okay. <laughs> So in my perfect world, I know you all can't make any absolute promises, but I drafted this as a re resolution in the hope that ARPA funds would be used and that ARPA funds, uh, the use of ARPA funds would be consistent with these warrant articles. Well, uh, I believe that they are, and I would love nothing better than to stand up at town meeting and have them say that select board has voted to work to identify these funds so that this work can continue. That's my presentation. Okay. Um, Mel, do you wanna say anything um, before I open it up to select board members about what we know so far about what we can use ARPA funds? Uh, no, I, I don't have anything more to say, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Okay. Bernard? Yeah. Um, this, this board has consistently agreed to use uh, stimulus money or other funds we receive from the government, like the CDVG, to assist uh, um, Brookline Housing Authority um, capital projects. Uh, that's been our consistent uh, position, and it uh, continues to be our position. My only concern is that I don't want to lock ourselves into committing to use uh, town funds, for example, reserve funds uh, for projects that are worthy, but are competing with other needs of the town and may not be totally uh, well competing with other needs of the town. And the way that the, uh, the proposal, the uh, Warren article is written, it, it seems to be saying uh, an American uh, rescue plan monies or other funds uh, available. And I don't want you know, any implication that we're, um, you're suggesting that, that we would use uh, um, what, what has been proposed uh, initially, I don't think anymore, but reserve fund uh, monies and, and other town monies. Okay, um, before any of the other select board members speak, keep it very, very brief because I forgot this is a public hearing and we actually will need a public comment if anybody raises their hand, Mary. <laughs> Uh, I think we should fund it. And I don't have any problem with that money coming from the reserve fund. So I don't have any problem with this. Uh, John. Um, I don't have a problem with the um, spending of the ARPA funds on these purposes. And I do hope that in the end we do that. Um, I think this resolution, unfortunately, sets uh, a precedent that we should not set. Um, and that is simply that we use a resolution to do what we need to do through a budgeting process. The decision, the time for the decision on the use of those ARPA funds is when we know that we can use them and when we know what the other needs are that we could spend the money on. And then we can come to a decision on, on the totality of how to spend the money. But to go outside that process and simply um, you know, start with a resolution before we even know if the ARPA funds can be used for this purpose, I don't think is good good policy. Raul. I'll just say I agree with Miriam's take on this and also just to say that there are plenty of Warren articles that are not in the form of a budget amendment necessarily that also will have undeniably uh, impacts on our budget. And so that is a regular part of our business and this is no different, thanks. Uh, my own personal feeling is um, I, I agree that this is worthy. Um, I, I'm just troubled that we're not getting this request from the executive director of BHA. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this since this is a public hearing? At this time, there are seven attendees. I am checking the Q&A. So Miriam, I saw your hand up. Um, we're going to have to vote on this so that uh, you know we have a recommendation. No worries. Okay. No worries. And it appears that no one is using the hand raise or Q&A feature to indicate they'd like to make a comment at this time. Okay. 
So I guess the um, the motion is favorable action on the mm. petitioner's um, motion for articles. Is it one and two? We need to take them separately or together. Your your preference. Um, let's take them together um, and see what happens. Um, unless anybody wants me to take them separately. Okay. Uh, so favorable action on the petitioner's motions on special town meeting uh, war warrant articles one and two. Um, Bernard. No. Raul. Aye. John. No. Miriam. Aye. And the chair votes no. Thank you very much and good luck. That's uh, 55. Okay. <laughs> yes, beautiful. See you in town meeting. <laughs> See you in five Good minutes. Town meeting. Bye.